We're working through the Gospel of John throughout the course of these three weeks of fasting, but we're also wanting to say, you know, Jesus, if, if we're not careful, we will, we will think that Jesus came specifically and only for us as individuals. And the truth of the matter is Jesus came for the world. God so loved the world. world. And what did he do? He sent his only begotten sons and daughters. That those who, as a result of their testimony, believe in him should enter into the kind of life that he came to, to bring. And, and frankly, brothers and sisters, that means the church. That's the church. Uh, church has taken a lot of hits over the last year and a half, two years. And some, candidly, self-inflicted and deserved. We have, as a result of our often, and I'm going to use our now in a larger collective sense, but in the sense of our bowing down to some of the idols of our culture, of being swept up in a wave of partisan politics, in being fragmented uh, on issues of, of race and justice and um, even social policy relative to masks and vaccines, we, 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 we have become in many ways, and again collectively, experts in missing the point. And it is for that reason that I think we want to spend some time saying, why church? And I'm using that both in the noun and the verb sense. Why the church? Why is this still God's chosen plan? We don't get to choose another thing. It's not like, well, I don't want a church anymore. Well, that's too bad. It's, it's not your island. God has chosen the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, as the primary means by which to disseminate his love and care for the world. We, we, don't, we don't have a plan B. There is none. So we need to get good at being the church, but then we also net, need to get good at churching. Not just the, 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 the what, but the how. And it will not surprise you to know that God has got some things to say to us on the how side as well as on the why side and the who side. Does, does that make sense? So we're going to be looking at uh, this book in the Bible that focuses on this kind of ecclesiology, this theology of the church uh, in the book of Ephesians. And uh, thinking through uh, both the, the kind of larger universal body of Christ, capital C church, but also it will not surprise you to know that when the New Testament speaks of the church, almost 95, 90% of the time, it's talking about a local church like this, a collection of people who gather on a Sunday or a Saturday or some other time who are, 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 are because it's easy to talk about, you know, the universal big C church, this, this, this um, uh, body of Christ marching through the ages. But where we get stuck is, um, uh, the you know corner fifth and main or Cerritos and seventh. Oh, that church with people like me in it, who annoy me and frustrate me as much as I annoy and frustrate them. Who get it wrong like I do as much as I get it wrong. This can't be God's best option. And the deep truth is, yeah, this is it. That's why it's important that we not get distracted, that we not pull ourselves off course, that we not uh, major on minors, but that we get it right, who we are and, and how we are to do and accomplish what God is, is up to. The, uh, and my job this morning, we're going to be spending the next uh, chunk of time, a uh, good chunk of this year, working through, uh, through this because uh, uh, the garden has taken a lot of hits this last year. Uh, in in a variety of ways, personally, uh, and 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 just in in large in, in our community, we haven't been spared this. 
Uh, and so we want to say, who are we and why are we here? Not just about a vision of this local church, but how does this church fit into what God is doing in the world? And how can we more align ourselves to that purpose? So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking at that through the lens of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians uh, is a circulated letter. It actually was not written specifically to the church at Ephesus. It was written to the seven churches of Asia Minor, parallel to the ones in the book of Revelation. It landed in Ephesus because Ephesus was kind of the central city in those, among those seven. Uh, and a, as it turns out, the uh, kind of the headquarters of the church in Asia Minor, uh, the New Testament was first kind of pulled together at Ephesus by a bishop named Onesimus, whose name might uh, be familiar if you've read the book of Philemon. Uh, so uh, it, it is a, a church pastored by, by uh, Timothy, pastored by John for a chunk of time. So it's, it's uh, a church that Paul invested himself in. Uh, he was there for over two years and kind of helped them understand who they are and what they're about. The gospel uh, was so significant in Ephesus. Uh, so you see it, for example, in Ephesians chapter 9, that it affected the economy of the city. Certain industries were impacted by revival. Can I just suggest that that's what revival actually looks like? Revival is not having a happy, holy time with Jesus on a Sunday morning. Revival is the jails are empty. The industries change. Do, 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 do you see what I'm after? So if revival is just about us and Jesus, we've missed the point. Revival has to, and this is why, why Paul is so... So, so adamant about not just why the church, but how the church as well. Uh, and so this letter is powerful and beautiful. It is heavily, almost stratospherically theological. And at the same time, it is intensely practical. The first half is the theology. The back half is the practice, verse, chapters 1 through 3, and then 4 through 6. And my job this morning is to bore you with an overview of the whole thing. Uh, so buckle up. Uh, it'll be over in about 15, 20 minutes. Um, but what, what Paul is trying to do here is in this first half, chapters 1 through 3, is to focus on the why, and the back half is to focus on the, on the how. And so he begins not with us, but with God, which is where everything ought properly to start. And, and so he starts off in, in chapter 1, verses 1 through uh, 14, one single sentence, 14 verses long, in which he just goes off on the mission of God. What God is up to in the world, what, why this matters, and he will land on this understanding that God's mission, and we'll start with this next week, is to redeem and restore all things that have been damaged and broken by our failure to be human in the way God designed us to be human. So our Genesis 3 rebellion, our attempts at freedom that led to greater captivity, broke the system. Uh, not just for us, not just for human beings, but because we are created to be the linkage between God, the, the, the spiritual universe, if you will, and the physical universe. We are the image of God. We are representing God to the world and the world to God. When we forget who we are, when we cease to be who God has created us to be, the whole thing starts to go wonky. And, and needs to be restored, needs to hit that do-over button, needs to kind of manufacturer's default settings restored. And that's God's purpose. So please notice, the gospel cannot ever be reduced to your personal salvation. It is That, that might be the center of it, but it's not the circumference of it. God has way more in mind than getting you into heaven. Frankly, that's fairly easy. 
What he's after is getting heaven into you. That's a bit more challenging. Because then and then only are you useful, we are useful to God's larger plan to save the world. And let us be clear, save the world includes whales and cows just as much as it includes people. Now do you understand why we ought to be not belligerently, but theologically environmental in our ecological concern? If Father spoke this into being, we should be among the leaders of those who care for the planet, not dragging our feet because it's going to inconvenience our lifestyle. That's why the church. Now, sadly, we have sold our soul <laughs> for 30 pieces of silver like everybody else, you know? And so you understand why he might have some work and reconciliation to do. You see where we're going here. So he invites us into this awareness that the gospel centering on people uh, and, and, and extending to the reconciliation of all things. And, and by the way, while I'm saying this, we don't get to choose another mission. Every, I've been you know, walking with pastors and churches for 40 some odd years and every once in a while I'll get somebody, can you help us formulate our mission statement? Can you help us formulate our vision statement? My answer is, what's wrong with the old one? You don't get to have your own mission. You, you can opt into God's or you can wander in the wilderness on your own, but God's mission is to redeem and restore all things. You don't get to have another mission. That, that means poor as well as rich. That means different ethnicities. That means gender equalities. That means all kinds of things because God is going to go back at the, at the end. He's going to go back to the way it was at the beginning. And he invites us into that in our life together. So, so, and, and he's going to do this in a unique way through the, through, the, through the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the return of Jesus. So Jesus is central to the book of Ephesians, central to the life of the church. Jesus, it's all, at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus, which is why the parallel reading in John is so helpful here, because no human system is going to work. No way of doing any of this. So we can, for example, one of the things that we've done, unfortunately, in the church and the more progressive elements of the church is we have said, oh, okay, got it. That's what God's mission is. All right, thanks so much. Now I know where we're going. I got it from here. No, you don't. Because inevitably, you will choose, we will choose broken systems of the world to try and accomplish kingdom outcomes. And the outcome will be broken systems of the world in Jesus' name. It will not accomplish the kingdom. It's not that, for example, structures and theories of leadership that work at General Motors don't work in the church. Because the church is comprised of people, the things that work in other settings also work in this administration. It's just that the outcome is not the kingdom. The outcome is a more effective, efficient organization, perhaps, which is only helpful if you're heading in the right place, uh, heading in the right direction in the first place. Efficiency isn't helpful if you're going in the wrong direction. You, you know, it's like you're lost on the middle of the my, I, line from my dad, my mom, reading the map. We're lost. My dad said, it doesn't matter, we're making great time. <laughs> making great time only works if you're going where you want to go, right? So, so this, this is why, why, why Jesus is not going to trust the structures of the church. And this has been one of the ways that the church has really taken hit, hasn't it? Over this last year, year and a half, two years particularly, we've had highlights of violations of, of ethics and morality in high places in church leadership, and on and on the list goes. That is what we ought to expect when we take the systems of General Motors and apply them to the church of Jesus Christ. It won't work. It won't work. Not to produce the, the kingdom outcome. 
Do, do you see where we're going here? So he invites us into this, the reforming of people uh, capable of being reconciled. So he's not going to just hit the do-over, start over again. He's going to form us. He's going to train us. He's going to shape us into being the kinds of people who can partner out of our proper identity as to be part of the mission of, 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 of God. And these people are, are the church. Now, Paul is very aware that this is not a human endeavor. And so he ends this first chapter with a prayer. And I want you to, having what I've just said here, kind of listen to how he prays. It begins at verse 15 of chapter 1. He says, For this reason then, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now here's the prayer. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, our glorious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you can know him better. And I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you might know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, his incomparably great power available to us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every name that is invoked not only in the present age but in the one to come. And God placed everything under his feet appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So this is centered on Jesus, and the church is the, the, the presence of Jesus in the world. That's why we don't get to opt out of church. Brothers and sisters, we don't go to church. We are the church. And we are needed more desperately than ever in the world today because we represent, we are Jesus with flesh. We are Jesus that, that has skin on, if you will. So I'm thinking you're probably aware this is going to take some work. That's why he prays this. By the way, if you ever are stuck with something to pray for yourself, that prayer is a good place to to, to, to memorize and soak in, right? Because it starts to work its way through in the shaping of our being. So then he goes on in chapter, that's, that's just the first chapter. Then he goes on in chapter two and begins to say, now we've got some work to do to get you from where you are and who you understand yourselves to be, both Jews and Gentiles, both those who are ostensibly God's people and those who are ostensibly not, I, we need you both to have a different understanding of how, um, the, 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 how the world works and how you fit into it. So in chapter 2, he is, he is beginning to describe how God is going to accomplish his purpose in the larger world. And he starts with this microcosm of the church. I think it would be fair to say that if you look at the world today, I, was, I did a mini blog on this yesterday, and I, it just occurred to me that we are, I, I, I've only been watching this for the last 50 or so years, but, but I have never seen us so hyper-divided as we are now, and so vitriolic in our rhetoric against one another, right? I, I think it's fair to say that our world is in large measure very, very divided. So how do you think God is going to unite, reconcile, pull all of those disparate parts, you take whatever label you want and its opposite, how is he going to pull it all together? And chapter 2 says, I'm going to start with you guys. I'm going to start with the church. I'm going to take the two primary components of the church, Jew and Gentile, which are about as far apart as you can possibly get, and I'm going to use you to model for a watching world how people are about as far apart as you can possibly get can not only coexist but become family. 
I'm going to show the world how to do that by teaching you how to love one another. That's chapter 2. And he invites us into this awareness that it is in Christ himself, in the work of Christ on the cross himself, that all of the divisions, all of the broken, have been relativized. All of the ways that we have understood ourselves, all of our distinctive, all, all of the things that we, we, we used to rely on to know who we were, male, female, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, none of those things are relevant anymore in Christ we find a new identity. No matter how deep set, how catastrophic those divisions are, we are brought together where the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And we find ourselves standing, beginning in this microcosmic way, in this tiny way. This is why it's so important. And by the way, please, spoiler alert, why things that divide us from one another in the church are way more damaging to the work of God in the world than anything else. Way more damaging. And why it's so essential that we get it right. Uh, Paul is very aware that because we so desperately need to get this right, and the only way we're going to accomplish this is to recognize how much God loved us and then to let that love work its way through into our relationships with other people. This is, this is, this is Paul's version of what Jesus said to us. Guys, the way the world is going to know that you're my disciples is that you love one another. That's the only way. Not that you believe the right stuff. Not that you can preach a three-point sermon with a poem and a song. Not that you can fill in the blanks of our normal ways of understanding ourselves as disciples. The single primary determinant that is witness to the world is that all of you people who are disparate, and some of you wouldn't be caught dead in the same room with one another. We have, we have people of all political stripes here. We have people with varying, varying background. We have all, all, of, all, all of the things, all of the things. What, how is this going to work again? We are deeply, truly, passionately loved by the same king and creator of the universe. And whom he has loved, I don't get to despise. That's why we don't get to have enemies. That's why my first concern about you is not your politics, not your gender, not your education. I want to see the love of God bouncing off of you to me and vice versa. Do you, do you see? I want to see him in you. And by the way, if I don't, it's not your problem, it's my problem. Because he is in you. And if I'm not seeing him there, it's not because he's not there, it's because I'm not seeing properly. So this is why he prays here in the uh, 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 second of prayer, uh, second prayer of Paul's. This is God's strategy, the strategy of love. In chapter 3, as he bridges out of this second and third chapter, because in the third chapter, he, he goes into uh, this, 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 uh, the, the, the ways in which God has accomplished this on Christ on the, in, in Christ on the cross and is inviting us into this. So he lands this first half of the book in this prayer. Look at, listen to it in chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason, he says, I bow before the Father from whom Every family. Do you see what he's doing here? God is not just my father. He is the father of everyone. Everyone. In heaven and on earth. All of them derive their name from him. So I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ can dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you then, being rooted and established in love, can have the power, together with all of the Lord's holy people, community again, to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love existentially, experientially, to know this love 
that surpasses your knowing so that you can be filled, get it, to the measure of the fullness of God. I know the words, and I know what the words mean. I have not a clue what the fullness of God is, but I want it desperately. And that's why we start with the foundation and why love is the only way. And, and the, again, we don't get to choose not to church. We don't get to choose how to church either. Love is the only way that God has authorized to save the world. Please notice, let me say it again. Love is the only way that God has authorized by which the world is going to be saved, not by electing the right guy, not by changing the laws, not by protest, not by any other social means. By the way, those things may all be very good, but they have to flow out of love. Otherwise, they're counterproductive. If we, if we, this is what, what's happened, fairly fair to say, we've gotten distracted. We've gone down the rabbit hole of crazy. And then we wonder why we can't find our, our, our way out. We've abandoned the single thing he asked us to do. Love one another. And do it in, in, in significant transformative ways. Then, he says, here's how that works itself out. The very first thing, chapter 4, I want you to be unified. I want you to get along. The Holy Spirit has produced unity in you. Now, you're going to have to work as hard as you possibly can, harder than you've ever worked at anything else in your entire lives. I want you to maintain the unity that the Spirit has produced. It'll require you to be humble. It'll require you to be gentle. It'll require you to be patient. At the very least, it's going to require you to put up with people who are like you. You see, here he is. He's Mount Everest, chapters 1 through 3. All of the wonder, the glory, the greatness, the goodness of God. And then he says, now, get along. Of course you're different. Irrelevant. You work on diversity from the standpoint of unity, not the other way around. Diversity is essential. It really is, but you can't lead with it. You don't get diversity if you focus on diversity. You get diversity if you focus on unity. So we recognize, chapter 4, that out of that deep unity maintained, worked on by the Spirit, instead of these fearful, prideful attitudes and actions, we choose to work hard to maintain that unity. And then out of it, we are called to be fully our unique selves, enabled by the same Spirit to build out the body of Christ on mission. And, and, and uh, not, no surprise, uh, God has a way of providing leadership that is not about superiority, it's not about domination, it's not about authority in any real sense, it's about individuals given to the church for the sake of helping each member of the church discover what their gifts are and utilize them to equip and release them. They're called evangelists, uh, apostles, prophets, pastor, teachers. Those people are given as gifts to the church, not for the purpose of leading. Leadership is not a big deal in the New Testament. It just isn't, Um, except in, in the sense of going first in service and surrender. So he's given these these positions, these people to the church for the sake of equipping and releasing the church for the work of mission and ministry. And again, this is an important piece here uh, for us to, 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 to remember. If we're not careful, if we take the General Motors or Apple or you know, f- whatever the corporation is, if we take that model that works in that social uh, entity, that institution, again, it will, it will produce a certain kind of institutional understanding right, with a hierarchical model of leaders and so on and so forth, but it won't be the church. This is why Jesus, you don't get to have hierarchy. We're going to reestablish a flat system where everybody has a part to play and everybody does their part in relation to one another 
And persons are given not to provide authoritarian leadership, but to provide linkages and connections and support so the whole body functions in the way that it is supposed to function. They serve self-sacrifice, uh, self-sacrificially so that they can accomplish that purpose. And uh, unfortunately, the only way this is going to work, Paul says, is you can't be the same as everybody else. You got to be holy. In fact, let me be clear, Paul says, you are holy. Now, act like it. You don't act towards holiness. You act out of holiness. God has declared you to be set apart. Now, that means you're married in a different way than everybody else is. That means you handle your sexuality in a different way than everybody else does. That means you don't let the old ways that were characteristic of a dying system manage how you ha handle your money. You don't get to do that anymore. We, we, we work in collaborative, cooperative, relational community. We start with, with marriage. We start with, with parents and children. Uh, it, the, the hierarchical model of fathers and mothers over... No, 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 no. Your, your job as a parent is to parent your children so that they can become your brothers and sisters in Christ. It works in employment. As an employer or an employee, same, same model. So holiness is a big deal. Uh, and, and it becomes the, the means by which we can actually be useful in the, in the world. And then he lands the plane in chapter 5 and 6 by saying, you guys live in evil times. So you need to learn how to tell time. You need to learn how to pay attention to where the kingdom is breaking in. To make the most then of every opportunity. And this isn't going to be helpful if you're drunk. So, no wine. Be filled with the Spirit instead. Do you see what he's after here? Why does he pick on that? Well, because the use of alcohol was a primary uh, component in the worship of the goddess Artemis, whose temple was in Ephesus, one of the seven wonders of the world, arguably greater than the pyramids. And Paul says, guys, if you just do what your culture is doing, you're not going to be helpful to your culture. If you are distracted by the same things, if you handle pain the same way they do, you're not going to be useful. So don't get drunk with wine. Instead, be being filled with the Spirit so that you can tell time, so that you can partner with what God is working on in, in the world. And this, of course, is where it works out with marriage and mutual submission, husbands submitting to wives, wives submitting to husbands, and, and on and on the list goes. Now... Final, chapter 6, he says, you guys have got an enemy. You need to be aware of it. It's not the people, not flesh and blood. There are principalities and powers. You need to be aware of this. And by exerting your energies against people, you miss the point and play right into the hands of the actual enemy, who is the first and most notorious terrorist. And we function in the realm of fear. So we begin with the mission of God. We consider the nature of the church as part of the mission of God. And then we settle into the deep work of how this plays itself out in how we live on the ground. And I think it's going to be a great journey for us. I think it's going to be an important one for us. Uh, but I think it's important for us to remember that with the church is first a spiritual reality and only secondarily a sociological entity. We don't go to church. We are the church. And we don't get to vote on the irrelevance of the church. We get to partner with God to make it relevant. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, um, this is uh, challenging for a Sunday morning, different than what we normally do, but at the same time, it's an invitation into this moment, into this critical moment in our country, in our world, in our city, uh, in our own individual lives. And Lord, we, we don't want to miss a beat on what you're up to in this world. 
uh, we, I frankly confess that I've gotten distracted over this last couple of years uh, and, and headed off in directions that are not mine to head off in, in some particular ways. And Lord, I want to come back to the center. I want to come back to Jesus and follow him closely in the Gospel of John. And I want to, O oh Lord, let my soul be shaped by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Ephesus. And I pray, O oh Lord, for courage to buckle up and stay in the game in this season where we are most desperately needed. Now, I, I think really in some ways more than ever before. Help us, O oh Lord, not to abandon the means by which you have chosen to save the world. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.